been a couple of weeks off with camp meeting. I hope that things went well here while we were gone. Um, we have been spending some time in Romans chapter 12 and verse 1, where it says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, I encourage you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies, not just your mind, not just your spiritual part, but your whole being as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable, literally well-pleasing to God, which is your reasonable service. We focused on the phrase reasonable service comes from logikos, where we get logical, which means to in this case, to add up what the word of God says, because the logos is the word. It's not your own logic, it's the biblical logic, God's logic, of how best to serve God. And the word for service there is a unique word, not used for serving each other, but only used for serving God. So how do we actually serve God? How can you serve someone who has everything? The reality is the only thing God doesn't have is us. Human beings are the only holdout in the universe. God has connection with everything else, everyone else, every other being, every other life form. But we're the ones who disconnected ourselves back at the tree of knowledge of good and evil and have been trying to go on our own. We're the ones that are disconnected from God and in a disconnected state, we can't serve God. The only service we can bring to God is to bring ourselves back to him. And if you have a worship service and you take the offering and you sing a hymn and you give the announcements and you have prayers and you do whatever else you do, if you don't get around to the sacrifice, speaking from an Old Testament standpoint now, you haven't finished the worship. And when we come to worship God, if we don't bring ourselves and give ourselves up completely to him, our worship is meaningless and incomplete. God's not looking for what we can do for him or to him. He's not looking for great works. He's not looking for busyness. That's Satan's counterfeit. You know, when, when the appeal comes to give your heart to God, Satan says, right on, you need to do that, and let me tell you how. Now get busy. And God says, no, I'm not looking for busy. I'm looking for you. It's like the uh, wife who says to her husband, I want more. And he says, well, I'm providing the money and the food and the housing, and I'm helping with the dishes and the laundry. I'm, I'm doing everything. What more do you want? And the wife says, I want you. And we men say, we don't know quite how to do that. We struggle with that. But that's what God is asking for, is not our stuff and not our busyness and not our doing, but he wants us. And that's called a living sacrifice. We've illustrated this with Isaac. Isaac is the only sacrifice I can find in the Bible that came off the altar alive. But if you think about Isaac, he gave himself up to death. He laid on the altar, he was a willing sacrifice, and he would have died unless somebody else had intervened and God did and sent a substitute. God doesn't want us dead, he wants us alive, but there has to be a death in the process of coming alive. And where we focused that last time was the fact that well, let's go to these verses. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Paul draws a dichotomy between flesh and spirit, the way you're naturally born and the way we can be reborn. The law of the spirit of life in Christ has made us free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, you can't fix yourself. God did by sending his son in the likeness of sinful flesh. On account of sin, he condemns sin in the flesh. The old nature is irredeemable, unredeemable. 
The old nature God can't work with. The old nature can't be changed. The only thing that can happen to the old nature is it has to die. In order that the righteous or the rightness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, the old, but according to the spirit, the new. For those who live according to the flesh, the old set their minds on the things of the flesh. Those who live according to the spirit on the things of the spirit. Notice it's one or the other, not both. For to be fleshly minded, I wish they didn't change the word there, to be fleshly minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace because the fleshly mind is enmity against God. It is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. Notice verse 7. Don't miss that. This was our focus three weeks ago, which I'm sure you remember exactly all I said. Um, the fleshly mind, the natural mind, the way you and I are born in this world, fallen sinners, <clears throat> is enmity, is hatred towards God. How can we go from hatred towards God to hatred towards sin? Right now, we love sin and hate God. That's our natural self. How can that be completely flipped around to where we love God and actually hate sin? That's what God is after. Not just that we resist sin, not that just we, we quit sinning, not just that we just quit doing bad behavior, but God actually wants to bring us to the point where we find sin hateful, repulsive. I can't raise my hand and say I'm there yet, but I believe that's clearly what God wants. Naturally, we're hatred towards God. Notice it says our natural nature is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. That's the verse that says the old man, the natural person, the way we're born is not fixable. It's not redeemable. <clears throat> God can't even work with it. What has to happen is it has to die, that living sacrifice, so that a new nature can be put in its place. And I want to talk about that from a specific illustration today. So then, those who are in the flesh, your natural self, cannot please God. And yet Romans 12 verse 1 says that uh, he encourages us to give ourselves a living sacrifice to God, which is holy and, your Bible will say, acceptable, but it's well-pleasing. It's actually the same word you find here in verse 8 for please with a positive well put before it. In our natural self, we cannot please God, but as a living sacrifice in our new reborn self, we can not only please God, we can be well-pleasing to God. You see, I think we often focus on trying to be pleasing to God, which means I've got to go and do this and do that and do something and do, do all this stuff so that God will be pleased with me. No. It's not that we can do things and make God pleased with us. We can be. We ourselves can be someone God is well pleased with. We noted when we talked a little bit about Nicodemus, Jesus says to Nicodemus, you're not even going to see the kingdom of God unless you're born again. Nicodemus says, how can a man be born when he's old? Can I enter again into my mother's womb and be born? Jesus says, Unless you're born of water in the spirit, not the natural, but the new birth, you can't enter the kingdom of God. <clears throat> that which is flesh is flesh, that birth. That which is spirit is spirit, a new birth. The two don't mix. You're not both. You're not half of one and half the other. You're either all in one boat or all in the other. Therefore, don't marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. Jesus draws a very clear distinction. The old simply won't get us anywhere but dead. There's got to be a death to the old and a new life to the new. You can't be born again while the old is still alive because there can't be two of you alive at the same time. So this fits into the living sacrifice thing again. There has to be a death in order for us to rise to newness of life, which is life in Christ, where we can be, not just do, but be 
well-pleasing to God. So we know that the carnal mind is irredeemable. It's not subject to God and his laws. Remember, God's laws aren't rules. God's laws are simply how life works. Nor can it be. It's unredeemable. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's what? A new creation. You have to die to the old in order to become a new. Old things have passed away. We, when someone dies, what do we say? They passed away. Old things have died. All things have new, become new. Die, new birth, new life. I've been crucified with Christ. There's the death. You can't crucify yourself, by the way. Somebody else has to do it. You can't sacrifice yourself, but you can agree to be sacrificed. I've been crucified with Christ. Therefore, it's no longer I, the old carnal fleshly me that lives. The life that I now live in the flesh, yes, I'm still in the flesh, but I'm not of the flesh. I live by faith, trust in the Son of God who loved, himself, loved me and gave himself for me. The new life, when I've died, I can be born again. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, present your bodies in living sacrifice. There has to be a death. Then we can be holy and acceptable to God as we are given new life in the new birth. Now, I want to use an illustration today that is used in Scripture not as detailed as I'm going to give it, but it's inferred there very clearly. Have you ever been involved in grafting a plant or a tree? Marilyn has. She took a class in college and did it. Have you ever eaten a Honeycrisp apple? Have you ever eaten a Cosmic Crisp apple? Who knows what they're going to have next, the universal crisp or whatever. How do they get a consistent apple like that? You realize if you plant apple seeds, it's kind of like having kids. If you've had two kids or more, you know that they're different. And you can do a DNA test, and they actually do come from the same parents. The same two of you got together and made baby number one and then made baby number two, and how come they are so different? It's because genetics can go all kinds of places. And if you plant a cosmic crisp apple seed, who knows what you'll get you may get a really strong plant with a weak apple. You may get a great apple with a weak plant. You may get a darker or a lighter, just like your kids have different eye color, different hair color, different personality traits. If you just plant the seed, you're going to get the genetic variation. So how in the world do they get a consistent apple like a honey crisp? And they do it through grafting. And what you discover is that when you, <clears throat> when you inbreed the apples to get, finally, the botanist will get that apple that's really crisp, really tasty, really sweet, really whatever you're looking for. Size, look, taste, uh, texture. Once you get that, how do you repeat it? And one of the problems is with all the inbreeding that happens to get the, just the right apple is usually the root stock is weak. And so to keep getting the same apple, you can't plant the apple seeds. You actually have to go find apple trees, something of the same genetic basis with a strong root, which is often a more wild plant, and then you take a cutting off of a branch of the Honeycrisp apple tree and you have to put those two together so that the strong rootstock grows the Honeycrisp apple. Got that? So you have to start out with a tree. Now I got a, a little tree here. 
from a uh, YouTube video that I chopped up and made into little pieces for us here. The man here is from New Zealand and he found this tree, apple tree, growing in his mother's apple orchard. And he trans it was a, a uh, you might say a volunteer, a wild growth from a seed. He transplanted it into his own yard. And then he went around and he found three different branches from three different apple trees. I believe here he has a, a Granny Smith and I believe he had a, uh, anyway, three different apples. Three completely different apples from three different apple trees. Now, that's called the Sion. That's the branch that you're going to graft on. So you select your rootstock based on its vigor and size. Your rootstock will determine whether you have a dwarf tree or a full-size tree, by the way. That's all into the roots. Resistance to pests and diseases, soil and climate conditions, um, just the strength of the root is absolutely necessary to have a strong tree. Then you pick your Sion by deciding what kind of fruit you want. Which kinds of apples do you want? Now, it's fun here. He does a graph. There are many ways to do graphs, different graphs for different kinds of plants. But I just want you to watch this. Um, he takes the uh, Sion in his, which is on the left, and he puts it up against the tree and finds a spot there about the same size. And then he cuts off the original tree, cuts off the Sion, and he's going to whittle on them now. Going to create a cut um, at an angle on the rootstock. He's going to create a cut at an angle on the Sion. And he's going to have them be just about the same length so that if you put them together, they kind of match. Now he's going to do something else, which he, if I had the audio on, he'd be telling you to be very careful you don't cut yourself because he's going to make a slice into that Sion, um, which if that knife slips, he's going to hurt himself. So he says, be very, very careful. Make sure the knife is very sharp. Don't push too hard. Let the knife do its work. But he's going to cut a slit about two thirds of the way up through that um, angled cut. When he's done with that, he's going to do the same thing on the rootstock. Cut a similar V cut. And now when he's done, he's going to take the two and just put them together. like that. Now the wood that actually has to line up is the wood that's just under the bark. It's called the Cambrian. The center of wood isn't doing much anymore. The growth is the layer of wood just under the bark. That's why you've got to have approximately the same size branch so that the layer just under the bark lines up. Then he's going to wrap it. You can uh, do it with a tape now. Um, sometimes it's done with wax. The purpose of wrapping is to protect. There's a wound, right? There's a wound here in, the, in both the um, Sion and the rootstock. Uh, bugs could get in there and uh, cause disease. You also need to have moisture held in so it doesn't dry out. Plus the taping simply gives strength. Sometimes they'll use wax just to seal up the area. And now you've done all you can do. You just have to see what God does. So what happens? About three weeks later, there's some little buds beginning to come out the top of the Sion. This is above the graft. There you've got some little leaves coming out. Three weeks after that, about six weeks total, I want you to notice we've got leaves. Now he's going to pull off these little branches that are coming out below the graft because that's not what we want. We want all the energy to go above the graft into the new growth. Um, after about nine weeks, got quite a bit of growth going on. 
And notice he's going to show us the graph there. The graphs are taking nicely. After about a dozen weeks, uh, there's the one graft looking pretty good. Notice how it's all grown together. Those are the grafts and the, the little capillaries inside the wood have lined up and uh, you have a very solid new growth. And everything above that graft will produce exactly what was on the branch from the mother tree that they took it off of. And here is the New Zealander with his tree. Uh, this is the end of the summer, probably three months later. And probably next year, we'll have three different kinds of apples on one tree. The branch to the left that's coming out is below the grafts. And he said in the video that next year, he's probably going to put a fourth uh, variety of apple on that branch. So why did we go through all of this? It's an interesting verse in uh, Romans 11. There's a whole illustration in Romans 11 which deals with a lot more than what we're talking about today. But speaking to the Gentile Christians, he said, you were cut out of the olive tree which is wild by nature and were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree. We are likened to being grafted into a different root structure. Now I want you to think for a minute. The sion, the part of the tree that gets, uh, the branch that gets grafted into the new rootstock. What has to happen to that little branch in order for it to be grafted in? It has to be completely and totally cut off. That is death. That branch has been severed from its rootstock and it is doomed to die. It has no way to live. It is sacrificed, as it were. But then the end is shaped to match the end of the new rootstock, and it is grafted in. And what would be dead, completely cut off from the old, there's no connection left to the old rootstock. It is then connected to a new rootstock. And at first, it's going to struggle, that new branch, to live because the connection of the capillaries in the Cambrian of the rootstock to the branch aren't well connected yet, but they're kind of pushed against each other. And if the graft is going to take enough of those millions of little capillaries have to line up that some nutrients begin to flow and then the capillaries grow together to where more and more of the nutrients flow until literally the old and the new become one branch. And the rootstock, the strong, hardy rootstock, sucks up the nutrients, sends them out the branch, and you're going to get fruit. Does that make sense? And I think the thing that we, we want to notice here is that the, the branch is completely severed from the old. It doesn't bring any of the old rootstock with it. It's the same branch. It looks the same. It's, and if it had a lousy rootstock, and it was a weak branch, it's still going to be a weak branch, but when it gets put onto the new rootstock, which is strong and robust and healthy, it's going to become, slowly, it's going to grow to become a strong and fruitful branch. There's absolutely no attempt to fix the old rootstock. You have to be grafted onto the new rootstock. Now here's some of the issues that we would have to look at as Christians. Our old rootstock is corrupt. Our old rootstock really isn't our rootstock. It's really Satan's rootstock. You say, wait a minute, I'm not satanic. You know, I was, before I was saved, I wasn't, you know, a raving demoniac. No, you weren't. 
But at the tree of knowledge of good and evil, essentially what we did is we clipped ourselves off of the tree of life because God's tree, God's rootstock is the only source of life. And we moved ourselves over and we tried to plant ourselves. We're going to be independent. We're going to find life on our own. Satan said, if you'll break away from God and his way of doing things and strike out on your own, you can become your own God. What he didn't tell us is that if we're not under the power of God and on his rootstock, Satan does a hostile takeover. We're never on our own. There are only two sides. There aren't three sides. There isn't God and Satan and me. Satan is exponentially more powerful than I am. He does not respect my freedom. And if I am on my own, he will take over. Now, he connects me to his rootstock. He is feeding my life, but he does it in a way that he makes me think I'm doing it. I'm just living my own life. I'm just doing my own thing. What do you mean you tell me I'm under the control of Satan? How dare you? But let me suggest, just try changing yourself in fundamental ways, like how you react to stimuli, um, uh, how you think, how you feel. Try changing something about yourself, and you may find that for a few days you can act differently. But at some point along the line, a stimulus will hit your life, and you will react when you don't have time to think about it, in the same old way. And you can spend 60, 70, 80 years working on it, and you'll discover you're still reacting the same old way. Until hopefully before you die, you'll discover you aren't in control. Somebody else is pulling the strings because at the core level, you can't change. Now, modern counseling, it's called behavior modification, will try to teach you how to act differently. God really doesn't give a rip how you act. He cares about where the actions are coming from. He says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? He says, can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? Neither can you do good who are uh, used to doing evil. The Bible makes it very clear that our hearts got disconnected from God and got connected to the evil one. And he is pulling the strings and we can't fix it. No amount of behavior modification can fix it. You might manage to act different most of the time, but guess what? The people you live with that you know the best know the real you. And they see you don't change. God says the only way to deal with the rotten natural you and me is we have to be cut off from the old rootstock and grafted into a new rootstock. And that new rootstock will turn that old branch into something new that bears fruit and is healthy and is strong and exhibits the strength of character of the new rootstock. I want to just introduce one other thing today. And we'll pick this up next week. What is the difference between your nature and your character? Because we have to talk about this. Your nature is this thing you're born with, which the Bible calls your mind or your heart. It's what you are inside on the interior. It's what is unseen. It's the broken core, the unfixable, incorrigible inner person. It's the self that says me first, no matter what. 
It's called the flesh, the internal feelings, the lust. It's the root system below ground, out of sight, that supports what grows that is seen. Your character, on the other hand, is what's above the ground in the plant. Your nature is the root system you can't see. Your character is what you can see. And on that root system, a certain plant grows. What people see of you is your character, your actions, your reactions, your responses to the stimuli of life, the instinctual responses especially. By the way, your character is not your reputation. Your reputation is usually a false self that you try to put out there that you think people are going to like. My dad used to say, we don't want to give the wrong impression. And what he really meant is we don't want to give the real impression. We don't want people to know how we really act or how we really feel. We want to give the right impression so they will think we're okay when we're not. And my reputation is generally a bunch of elaborate fig leaves that I have tried to use to cover up what I believe is my inappropriate and unacceptable self. My character is how I act when I don't have time to think about how I'm going to act. It's the expression, outward expression of my inner feelings and lusts. It's the tree that's above the ground, the plant that others can see, the fruit that others can experience. It's my true style of relating. My nature is described by the word sin, singular. My character is described by the word sins, plural. My nature is broken, that's called sin. And out of that broken nature grows a plant which exhibits broken behavior, which is called sins. Jesus bore my sins on the cross. He did not bear my sin. He handled all the bad behavior problems because sins or sinners can be forgiven. But sin must die. The old nature has to die. You have to be cut off from it leave it, be grafted into the new. You have to get a new nature if you're going to get a new character. Here's one of the crazy things. Just think about this. If I cut off the plant from the old roots, the plant has a certain shape and health to it, right? If I graft it over to the new rootstock, when I first put the graft on and wrap it up, the plant looks the same as it did before, right? You might say, I still have the same old habits and patterns that I have cultivated on my own root, old rootstock. You come to Jesus and you say, well, I gave my life to Jesus and he said he killed the old and planted me on a new. How come I just sinned again? How come I just thought one of those old thoughts? How come I still have some of the same problems? In fact, all of them. Because the tree the branch is the same one that was on the old rootstock that got, that's put on the new rootstock. But the good news is, as the capillaries line up and the juices flow and you become one with the new rootstock, it will change the tree. Does that make sense? You get saved in an instant graft. Old is gone, new has come. Justification, I've been grafted into the new rootstock. I cannot die if I'm grafted in the new rootstock. But I'm still the same old tree that got put on the new rootstock. And it takes time for sanctification to happen, which is the now modification of the, new, the old tree into a new, healthier tree fruit-bearing tree because it's now connected to the old rootstock. That's going to take time. 
That's going to happen at the speed of the farm. And you can't do anything to speed it up. You can only suck up the juices from the new rootstock. Does that make sense? Morning by morning, and all day long thereafter, you suck up the juices from the new rootstock. It's called faith, trust. You simply cling. You abide. If we abide in the vine, we will bear fruit. If we abide in the vine, we will get pruned, the sin taken off. And what is abiding? Clinging to the graft. I just hang on to that new rootstock. And he says, those old habits, that old rotten fruit, that old fake stuff you've got going on there, you know, we try to decorate our tree so it looks better even though it's a mess. I'm going to strip off that decoration, he says, and oh, we feel naked. But he says, we let the juice, you let the juices flow, and day by day at the speed of the farm, your tree will be transformed on the outside because it was instantly reconnected on the inside. The instant reconnection, the graft, is justification. You go from a dead rootstock to a live rootstock. You still have some of the old habits on the outside, but God's given you a new heart on the inside and it'll take some time for that new root system to completely transform the old tree into a new glorious fruit bearing tree. So when the Bible says, present yourselves a living sacrifice, you come to God and say, kill me. Cut me off from the old. I know that's death to everything I thought I wanted. I know that's, if, if, if the new graft doesn't take, I'm dead, but you've got to be cut off first. You can't like get grafted on and then cut off, like no risk. Grafting. <laughs> the good news is God's never blown a graft yet. But you have to say, cut me off. Graft me in. And I'm going to hang on. The transformation of the tree comes only by my clinging to the new rootstock. I can't do any fancy deeds to create fruit or leaves or foliage or health. I can only hang on. It's by faith alone. I trust and I cling to Jesus, my new rootstock. And he guarantees if I let him begin a good work, he'll bring it to completion. He'll get the tree like it needs to be, bearing good fruit. I don't have to worry about fruit and I don't have to worry about broken or dead limbs. Grafted on the new roadstock, he says, you will bear good fruit, give it some time, and I will prune off the stuff that needs to go, and that'll hurt. And you may feel a little naked now and then when we prune off a bunch of leaves, because too many leaves, you don't have enough fruit, and he'll pull off the suckers so that the energy is, you get the point? So I want you to take hope in a couple of things. Number one, you're not hopeless. You are hopeless, but you're not hopeless because he can cut you off from the hopeless and graft you into the hopeful. Number two, just because you committed a sin after you gave your life to Jesus, by the way, Satan tempts you to do it, then he blames you for doing it, then he tells you you're doing it as proof you haven't been saved. No. The old external branch was grafted onto the new roots. You've still got the characteristics, character, you had connected to the old. But you're now connected to the new, which can now transform your character. And you can become new on the outside because you've been made new on the inside. 
We usually try to do just the opposite. We cling to our old dead root structure and we try to fancy up our tree. It says, no, got to die. Got to be grafted. And then just cling. The tree will be taken care of. The new character will happen one day at a time. New patterns, new habits, new likes, new desires like Christ. That will happen at the speed of the farm, but he guarantees to get the job done in time. Amen? Let's pray. Jesus, there are so many different ways that we try to understand your plan of salvation. And we recognize that the plan of salvation, how you save us is an infinite subject beyond anything we will ever throughout eternity fully understand. We will come to see it clearer and clearer forever and ever. As our characters will continue to become more and more like you forever and ever because you're infinite. So we always have an infinite way to go. Even though things are good, they can always be better. So Lord, as we've looked at this illustration, stick it in our minds. We've got to be cut off. The graft guarantees our life. The character will take time to reform. But the new life is instantaneous when we're in, grafted into your healthy, perfect, infinite rootstock. Thank you for being willing to take us back in. We cut ourselves off at the tree, but you welcome us to graft us back in to the stock we were supposed to be growing on all along. Thank you for receiving us. May we cling to you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.